Praise the Lord. I appreciate the Lord this morning. Appreciate the Spirit of the Lord. There's not anything that will take the place of the Spirit of the Lord. <laughs> and I appreciate that song. Uh, Brother Noah and Sister Caleb was singing. Whoever wrote that song certainly has a vision of the body of Christ. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's good from time to time to rehearse who we are and where we came from. <clears throat> you know, uh, the... Uh, <clears throat> I might... I might, uh, I might take a minute. Let me get my Bible. Bring me my Bible, brother. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> have some understanding of where we're at if you'll turn in your Bibles to Revelation, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> I'll just... I'll start off there because it's a common uh, teaching among us <clears throat> of what the, these are the, the seven seals are opened up in the, <clears throat> in the uh, sixth chapter of the book of Revelations. I'll, uh, <clears throat> let's start in the fifth chapter. I think it would be a good place to start, get a little bit of a foundation of the subject. <clears throat> good to see you, Brother Shelby. I mean, not brother, brother Ray, I'm sorry. Brother Weaver, we've been missing you. I know it's during this COVID thing, it's been somewhat difficult for everybody, but uh, I'm thankful that we're still able to have services in fact, I've been talking to some of the brethren about at least trying to have a pastor's meeting after <clears throat> the first of, in the spring. You know, I don't think we ought to do it during the time that the flu season starts and COVID's still here, but hopefully we'll have a vaccine and, <clears throat> and uh, You know, and hopefully things will be better by spring. And uh, but, you know, I, 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 we could at least, in my thinking, if we can have funerals and weddings and things like that, we ought to be able to just get the pastors together and have enough social distancing. And we have enough buildings. I'm willing. I'd be willing to have it here, or wherever the brother want to have it. <clears throat> but I think we need to have. Uh, we need to stay together. We need to have fellowship because of our vision. <clears throat> we, can't, we can't accomplish our vision in, in just a local church. Our local churches are important, but the body of Christ is, is uh, <clears throat> more important than the local church. Local church, you, you got to have a local church, but you, you've got to have a body of uh, brethren, like I was saying in Bible study today. We've got to have fellowship <clears throat> to take us to unity. And uh, But here, here in the uh, fifth chapter of the book of Revelations, I start in the first verse. It said, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside. Sealed with seven seals. <clears throat> I first time I looked at that and really saw it, I thought, "Wow, this is." Uh, thank you, brother. Yes. <clears throat> um, um, a book written within and on the back side. I thought that's strange. It's you right on the back of a book on the back side of the whole book. It dawned on to me that it's talking about <clears throat> the Word of God, this Bible, 
it's written within. God gave it, but when he gave John this book of Revelation, <clears throat> the backside is something that follows. It's behind everything. The book of Revelation followed the Old and New Testament <clears throat> and uh, was the last book written. And then it was sealed with seven seals. <clears throat> if you read on a little bit, verse 2 said, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is, who is worthy? The question is raised. Who's worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, somebody, some man must be in heaven by the time this was written. <clears throat> There's no man in heaven, it says. I think the angel that, that showed this to John would know rather not who's in heaven. Nor in earth. Neither under the earth, that would have to be people in the grave, was able to open the book, neither look thereon. <clears throat> and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. <clears throat> One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. See, John, he seen this picture, and when he saw, there ain't no, you know, you're not going to get to see it because nobody's worthy to open it. <laughs> this, this much has really touched him in the spirit because he started crying. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seals thereof. And, be, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders... <clears throat> That's the ministry and the four beasts. I, I just don't have time to explain it all to you, but that's the that was really the encampment around Israel. This is just a picture of how that Israel was encamped. There were twelve tribes, three in each tribe, four places: north, east, south, and west. That God had them encamped around the throne, <clears throat> and they were called four beasts because everyone, every tribe had their own flag. And one, one tribe was in charge of each one of the three tribes in each location, east, south, west, and north. And Judah was the first one on the east, and their flag was the lion. And then, <clears throat> uh, who, was on the, let's see, who was on the south? Eth, uh, Ephraim, and that was... Uh, <clears throat> his flag was was an emblem of a man. And then on the west was, uh, uh, who was it that, that uh, had the oxen there? <clears throat> Excuse me. That was uh, Reuben. Reuben, his flag was a flag of an oxen or a calf. <clears throat> and uh, then the last one on the north was was Dan was in charge of those three tribes, <clears throat> and his flag was that of a, a eagle. You can't really find, you can find the line of the tribe of Judah, you can find Ephraim was, uh, uh, was, a, was an oxen or a calf, but you can't find eagle, or, or the, the, but you can find it in Jewish history. You search Jewish history, you'll find out that that's true, that they did have those flags. And in the fourth chapter of Numbers, you'll find out that they all had their own ensign. And they were encamped around the throne in those 12 tribes, three, three to a group. <clears throat> that, that's just a picture that John saw. It's just a picture of the body of Christ. We're encamped around the throne of God. And, the thr and under the new covenant, the throne of God is the... The, uh, it's the Lord, the operation of the Lord. See, this is no longer a natural temple, but it is, you know, uh, the church is the temple. And we're encamped about the church, and Jesus is, is the center of it, which he's, in, he's our mediator in the holy place. Anyway, I don't want to go into too many. And then having seven horns and seven eyes. Horns in the Bible of powers and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God 
set forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So he had prevailed to open these seven seals. This book is sealed up. Do you know you can't understand the word of God if somebody don't reveal it to you? It's a spiritual book and it takes the spirit of God to reveal it. <clears throat> and um, so these seven spirits which are, there's seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God and <clears throat> uh, they, they are uh, mentioned as being uh, the, the seven, if you back up to the fourth chapter, let me back up there in the fifth verse, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thundering and voices. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Uh, uh, they're, they're mentioned <clears throat> more times than that in, in the book of Revelation. One place it says they, they're, <clears throat> they're going to and fro in the earth. The seven spirits of God, there's a, the, in the holy place of the temple, the temple had an outer court. You went in through the gate, there was a brazen altar, and that's where you took your sacrifice. It was offered up on the altar and burned there. The the priest took the blood, he took a certain amount of blood of the a sacrifice, he took it to the uh, over to the laver and he washed himself in the laver. The laver was a great old big bowl and it was lined with women's looking glasses. Women's looking glasses were made out of polished brass. That's what we call today a mirror. Not made out of polished brass, but that's what they had back then. They hadn't developed a mirror, but they could polish brass and see their self in it. And that was called a woman's looking glass. And so they took polished brass and lined the bowl with it, fill it full of water, and when the priest looked down in there, he could see himself. And that's just a picture <coughs> of washing <coughs> uh, by the word of God you know, in other words, the priest had to clean himself. First off, he had to have on a woolen garment to work in the outer court. <clears throat> Everything in the outer court was brass, which is, which is a type of flesh. Everything in the holy place was gold, which is a much richer metal. And uh, that, that depicts uh, God, the things of God, wisdom. Uh, God's dealing with us. Out, we're out here in the outer court and God's dealing with us because we still got a lot of flesh among us. And so there's a lot of brass out here. And, and the picture is, is that we have to offer up our sacrifice to the Lord <clears throat> and uh, our life is what our sacrifice is. We have to give our life to the Lord. And then we've got to look into the labor, which is this... James called it the perfect law of liberty. You look into the word of God and you'll see yourself. If you study this book enough and God helps you, you'll see yourself. You'll see what's wrong with you and what God wants corrected in your life. And, uh, and, and you still may have on a woolen garment, the flesh, but as you grow and develop in God, you finally get to going to get to a place where you have to have a garment change. And that's the priest, before he went into the holy place, he had to take off his woolen garment and put on a white linen garment, which is the righteousness of the saints. It tells you that in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. <clears throat> and for him to go into the holy place, he had to have on a white linen garment. It couldn't be a woolen garment you know, <clears throat> but it had to be a linen garment, white. White's the picture of righteousness. The righteousness of the saints is that white garment. And <clears throat> so right now we may have on woolen garments, but God's counting you righteous. And so he's, he's looking at you as though you had a white garment. He was saying, because of the work Jesus did, I'm considering you righteous. 
because of your faith in me and because you are diligently serving me while you're going through the process of salvation. <clears throat> See, a lot of people, if you, when, I, I grew up in Pentecost, Pentecostal churches, in an organization that, you know, they believed that when you came up to the altar like the people came today, and they gave their heart to God, that if they died right then, they'd go straight to heaven. <laughs> but you're not ready for heaven when you first give your heart to God. You've got a lot of change in that needs to be done. You're going to have to go through a process. Salvation is a process, and you're going to have to grow to a place to be heaven ready. Otherwise, if God took us, I say this all the time, if God took this little class to heaven today, hell would break out in glory before tomorrow morning. Because somebody in here would get mad at somebody. <clears throat> Did you bring your wife today? I mean your husband? Have y'all had a spat lately? Don't, don't raise your hand. No, don't put your hands back down. <clears throat> what about you young people? Have you got a brother or sister? Or what about, hey, did you argue with your mom today? Or, you know, kids tend to argue with their mom more than they argue with dad. They, they start out learning how to argue with mom first. You know, you can, mom, one time my mama, you know, I, I, you, kids get big, you know, they grow. My mama, she was just about this big. <laughs> she was four foot nine, and I think she fudged on that just a little bit. <clears throat> but, I never will forget one time. I'm, I'm ashamed of it today, but I remember her, you know, I was too big for her to whoop, so she took her shoe off and threw it at me. <laughs> I just caught it. I said, give me the other one. <laughs> made her so mad. <laughs> I should have been whooped right there. But anyway, <clears throat> I'm just showing you I wasn't quite ready yet. I had the Holy Ghost, but I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to go to heaven because you say, well, here's what the religious world teaches. Well, I've asked people this. What makes you think you're going to be righteous in heaven and never sin again? Most of the time they'll say, well, God's going to change me. You know what my next statement is? Do you realize how little sense that makes? God's going to change you? where you'll never sin again? Do you know what God would have to do for that to happen? He'd have to change your mind. He'd have to change the entire the way you think. You wouldn't even be you. You can't think. You, if God reprograms your mind where you don't even think like you think, you're not you. That's not you. And if that's true, why didn't God just make us that way to start with and stop all this what we're going through. Why didn't God just make us that way to start with? I'll tell you why he didn't. Because that would be people that were puppets that were made to serve God. And God's not interested in that. He's not interested in a fake heaven and a fake relationship with people that have to live right. God's interested in people that want to live right. God fixed you with a will and he's going to let you learn to live right. That's why we're down here and he's up there. Until we get this worked out and he makes us ready. See? He, you know, this where it said there wasn't nobody in heaven, well, there wasn't very many people in heaven anyway. It's just those early church overcomers that made the bride that will rule and reign with him for a thousand years, that's the only people that's went so far. But God intends for as many as, as, how does that say that? As many as will let him come and drink of the river of life freely. He, he don't charge anything for coming and drinking of this river of life, which is the Spirit of God. And it will change your life. It's life. That's what it is. The Spirit of God is life. It's His life. But 
<clears throat> you've heard that old statement that you are what you eat or you are what you drink. You know, uh, you are what you are because of what you have been. You are what you're going to be because of what you're going to do. If you don't do anything different, then there's a saying for that. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always be what you've always been. So, so you got to change. You know, I was talking about this paradigm change in the Bible. You know, paradigm is your... Your, that's your perspective of life or things. That's your, just your perspective of things. It's like that, you know, that guy, this <clears throat> admiral. He was on, in the United States Navy and he was, he was on this destroyer. And this guy says, uh, you know, he said, uh, admiral, said there's, there is a light at such and such location, so many, so much distance, so many, so cer- certain latitude, certain longitude of where we're at. Admiral said, is that light moving? He said, no, it's not moving. That meant we're on a head-on collision. See, I learned that flying an airplane too. If you're flying and you see another plane and that plane's not going left, right, up, or down, you're headed right straight into a collision. But if it's moving, then you know that he's not going. He's not headed straight for you. He's moving either to the right, the left, or he's going higher than you or below you. You can pick out his spot on your windshield, and if that moves, then you're not going to hit him. But if it don't move, you keep watching that, you're headed for a head-on collision. And that guy said, no, Admiral, it's not moving. He said, send a message and tell him to turn right 20 degrees. And he said, he sent a message, turn right 20 degrees. The message came back, said, you turn right 20 degrees. The admiral said, send him a message and tell him, this is an admiral on a destroyer in the United States Army. A message came back and said, this is a first class seaman and this is, and you need to turn right 20 degrees. The Admiral wrote back and said, send him a message and said, you need to listen to an, this is an Admiral. The message came back and said, this is a lighthouse. The admiral had a paradigm change. He said, uh, turn right 20 degrees. (laughs) Sometimes how we look at things is different than how we perceive it. And so we, we have to allow God to help us change uh, on things. This is what I'm giving you is a paradigm change. If you thought you're ready to go to heaven, I hope you get a paradigm change this morning because we all have a, a ways to go. Now, let me help you with this. There is such a thing as a resurrection of the dead. And if you're serving God with diligence and you're doing all you know to do to serve Him, you're safe because God, he'll do his part. All you got to do is your part. He'll, if, 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 you're, if you're serving God, you're going to finish and, and, and you're doing all you know to do, then he's going to preserve you in the resurrection. And <clears throat> this is a new twist for those out there. Because when you resurrect, you'll resurrect here on this earth in the flesh. And you'll have an opportunity to finish your course. See, those under the law in Matthew 27, 52, after Jesus' resurrection, read it, Matthew 27, 52, after Jesus' resurrection, 
Many of the saints which slept arose and went into the city and were seen of many. Now we, you know, you wonder what that was like. You know what Jesus told Caiaphas, the high priest? He said, you're going to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sit down in the kingdom of God and ye yourself thrust out. He told the high priest that. You're going to see. See, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had a resurrection coming and Caiaphas got to see it even though he, w he was cast out of the kingdom of heaven Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob resurrected with those in Matthew 27, 52 and went into the city. How would you like to have been sitting in one of those churches and said, how are you? What's your name, sir? He said, well, I'm Abraham. A the Abraham? <laughs> what would that be like? Well, you say, well, that don't, you know, compute in my brain. Do you think there's ever going to be a resurrection? Then somewhere it's going to have to compute in your brain. Somewhere, somebody's going to resurrect from the dead. And, and if you're living when it happens, <clears throat> the Bible does talk about it. It does talk about it. In the 11th chapter of, of Hebrews, uh, it said... Uh, see if I can get that scripture in my mind. Uh, in the 39th, can you hold your place in Revelations? I'll come back to it. But let's look in, in, in Hebrews 11. I'm thinking it's the 39th verse. <clears throat> and, and this whole chapter, you'll have to read it, but it's talking about the faithful, starting out with, the, by faith, Abel. See, by faith, Abel offered up a, a sacrifice that was a greater sacrifice than that of Cain. Talks about Abraham. Talks about Noah. Talks about Sarah. Talks about all the Old Testament worthies that lived by faith, having not received the promises. Because there was no life under the Old Testament. Nobody that died under the Old Testament ever went to heaven. There was no way to go to heaven. You couldn't go to heaven without being born again. And that didn't happen until Jesus came to this world. So all those people died and went the way of the earth and we were in the grave. Look what it says here after he tells about all these people in the old covenant that lived by faith, that didn't receive the promise. Then here in the 39th verse says, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God had been provided some better thing for us. Now this is Paul writing this in the Gentile, in the Jewish world, back there in the early church, and he's saying all of those people, they died having a good report, but they didn't receive the promise, but God provided some better thing for us because we're here and Jesus came and we've been born of the Holy Ghost. We've been born again. We're under the new covenant, which is a covenant that will take you to life, eternal. He has something better for us that they, without us, could not be made perfect. In other words, it's going to take them getting what we got. So they're going to have to receive what we've got. So God resurrected them from the dead so that they could receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and be born again of God's Spirit and they could get on the journey and finish their course unto life everlasting. Ain't that beautiful? See, God, death doesn't stop God. Death doesn't eliminate God from finishing His work in you. He just resurrects you from the dead. I never will forget the first time I thought about this. I thought, if I die, you know, I thought when I died, I was going somewhere, brother. Brother Weaver, they taught me out there, when you die, you're going somewhere. And here they said, you ain't going nowhere. 
except the grave. You're going to dust. Dust thou art, and dust shall thou return. And I thought, I'm going to disappear. I'm going to just cease to exist. I was laying in bed when I, I was thinking about that one night. I thought about that, and I got so, I got so, I got to thinking about that so much, and I thought, I finally just said, God, do you know where I'm at? Do you know who I am? I said, my name is Mick Smith, and here is my address. <laughs> because if I die, I used to say that little prayer, you know, now lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I said, if I die before I wake, I'm depending on you to remember who I am. I'm one of your children. And you're the only one that can ever let me have life again. I'm trusting you for that. I don't want to cease to exist. I want to live. I want to know something about this everlasting life. Even if I have to come back up here on the earth and finish my course. And I and I I still tell the Lord once in a while, you remember who I am, Lord? <laughs> Cuz I want to go. And and I'm trusting in him. And I'm looking for this restored church that they were singing about that God's going to give us everything that early church had. <clears throat> and so, let's, let's go back to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. It says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. I saw, and behold, a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. This white horse, in, in the Bible, prophetically, horses stand for uh, the church. Sister Claire, would you put up Joel, the second chapter, I think around the fourth verse? Would you put that up there for me? Um, that which the palmer wait a minute that's not what I'm wanting uh, is that 2-4 is it 1-4 oh put up 2-4 chapter 2 verse 4 yeah the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen so shall they run. See, in the, in the second chapter, Joel's talking about the, the early church. You remember, Jesus, um, Peter got up on the day of Pentecost and said, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he said, uh, young men will see visions and, young, and old men will dream dreams. And he, he, was, he was telling them, this is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. This is part of Joel's prophecy that that church had the appearance as horses. That's prophetical. Those horses were like churches. They represent churches. Put up Zechariah uh, 10, the uh, 10th chapter. Mm, let's try verse 3. The 10th chapter. Yes, mine anger was kindled against the shepherds. This is God talking. And I punished the goats, for the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Just showing you that prophetically, Zechariah as a prophet was prophesied about our day and about the New, New uh, Testament church. And they prophesied using the, the term horse, meaning the battle. Uh, or, or the church, I mean. And so I'm just showing you that these horses 
uh, represent the church. And the first horse in the first seal was a white horse. And white is the, uh, though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. I'll make you white as snow. See, white's a, the picture of righteousness. God will, red, scarlet's a picture of sin. So the red, when it turns to a red horse in a minute, see, that's the early church. Here's the picture. The early church was a white horse and the rider of the horse had a bow in his hand and he went forth conquering and to conquer. He, he, Jesus was the rider of the horse. That song said he was the head of the body. Well, I'm not going to read all these horses. Many of you know them. But, but the horse started out, the New Testament church was a white horse. And, and in the 19th chapter, Jesus comes riding on a white horse. And those that were with him were on white horses. <laughs> well, that's righteous people. I had a man tell me today, uh, or the other day, that, that he was reading where, or he was listening to a tape where a man was saying this white horse was the, the, uh, the false prophet, the beast, the Antichrist. See, that sounds strange to y'all, but it's exactly what I was taught all my life out in Pentecost exactly the way they teach it. Because they don't understand the symbols of prophecy. When I got in here, these brethren began to explain to me words that made sense and it fit. Everything began to fit in the puzzle. And I knew God had begun to reveal to me what His body is all about. See, then the next, I'm not going to read but one more because I'll, I'll just tell you, but then see in verse 3, it says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast come, say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and that there was given unto him a great sword. See, red, the red, the horse changed when the church began to fall away. And you'll never understand the Bible if you don't understand that the New Testament church fell away. After God finished harvesting the Jews, the Jewish world, he'd been de dealing with them for 2,000 years, and it's finally his time to bring it to fruition and harvest that world and make up a part of his bride. And then though they all rejected him that wouldn't accept that. And so he turned to the Gentiles. Now when Jesus turned to the Gentiles, he turned to a whole world of people that were idolaters, ungodly, worshipers of idols. They did not know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so God had to start. He started out with Cornelius, a Roman centurion and, and sent Peter to his house because he was a convert to Judaism. But he didn't understand everything about God, but he had a fear of God and he, he wanted to know more about God. And an angel sent, sent him, sent Peter, to, sent, said, send some men over to Peter. Uh, he's staying at a man's house by the name of Simon, a tanner. And tell him that an angel of God told you to tell him to come talk to to Cornelius and his household. And he went. Peter obeyed. God had to deal with him about it, but he went. And while he talked to them people about Jesus, the Holy Ghost fell on them, and they all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, he said, who, who can forbid water? <laughs> I mean, we need to baptize these people in water. They've got to be baptized that's part of the uh, commandment of the Lord, but we can't forbid that. These people's got the same Holy Ghost we got. So God opened this up to the Gentiles. He started off with the Apostle Paul being an apostle to the Gentile people all through Asia. But the church fell down out of righteousness into a scarlet a red horse. 
that's kind of a, like a Pentecostal era. And matter of fact, that's where I think we're at today. We're in a red horse state. We're not fully righteous or restored yet. We don't have all the power of God that the early church had. We don't have everything they had. But we're, we have a vision that God's going to take us to that restored place and give us what they had so we can accomplish harvesting the end of the Gentile world like they harvested the end of the Jewish world and finish that work that he started nearly 2,000 years ago like they finished the work that he started 2,000 years prior in the Jewish world that ended in the New Testament days that you read about and now, the church, though, we're reading here in the book of Revelation that the future for the Gentiles was that the church went from that white horse state to a red horse state. And look what it says about that. Power was given to him that sat thereon on the horse. The rider changed. See, man became the rider of the church. We said, that song said Jesus is the head of the church. Yes, he was the head of the New Testament church. But man, we're trying to get Jesus to be the head of the church today. But out here in Babylon and all of these different organizations, man's the head of it. They vote in their leaders. They're not looking to Jesus. They have to do what the leadership says and what their organization votes in. That's not New Testament order. And power was given unto them that sat there on to take peace from the earth. See, when men get in charge, peace is lost. Look, look at our government today. What kind of peace is our Democratic and Republican offices have got? It's pitiful. It's pitiful. There's less God in our government than's ever been in our government, in the United States of America. Matter of fact, they forgot God. They're fighting like little children. I can't even watch these presidential debates. I just have to turn it off. It's like two little kids. Two little children. They're supposed to be the, the great leaders of the land. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of our leadership. Pitiful. And that they should kill one another. You, you listen to the Democrats and Republicans and you think that's exactly what they'd like to do is just go ahead and take guns and shoot one another. You, you can't imagine. If, if you grew up when I grew up, you can't, you can't hardly believe this is the same United States of America. And there was given unto him a great sword. That's the word of God. But see, if a minister don't use the word of God with wisdom, if God don't help him, he'll use the word of God to separate and divide. And you'll never have peace or unity out here with all this division that's going on. That's why, and, and you know, then it went from the red horse to a black horse, which black is darkness. That's ignorance. The church fell out of a Pentecostal type era. That's where we came from. The Protestant era was like dark, a black horse. Ignorance. We didn't have too much knowledge about God. But when God gave us the Holy Ghost, God began to give more knowledge. And then it went from the black horse to a pale horse, which is the Catholic Church. That's what happened. The church went from the early church to a Pentecostal type era to a Protestant type era to the Catholic church, which was death and hell followed with it. That hell's not talking about a burning hell. It's talking about a religious hell. It's a hellish condition. They can't produce life. Death was the rider of the horse. The rider could not produce life. It couldn't give you anointing from heaven. But then God started a reformation years ago and we went back to the black horse, the Protestant era. It's history. You know it's true. And then, in 1901, the baptism of the Holy Ghost was restored to America in Topeka, Kansas. And Charlie Parham's little uh, school, really uh, Christian school, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost went from there to Houston, Texas, and then uh, wasn't it Seymour? Was it named Charles Seymour? Was it Charles or who was it? Is, I believe it was Charles. Who? William Seymour, thank you. 
went to he went to L.A. and wound up in the he went there to pastor a church, but they fired him. <laughs> he wound up in a little Zusa Street mission on a Zusa Street, a little mission, and out of that mission, hundreds and thousands of people began to go in there. Just they just go in there to pray, and the Holy Ghost had fallen. People began to get the Holy Ghost, and those people get the Holy Ghost, and they begin to spread that across America. And the, and the Pentecostal era was on. And we have been, this body has been the very crux of God bringing in the Pentecostal movement in the United States of America. There was a man by the name of William Souders in the 1900s, early 1900s, in 1912, and he was... He was, uh, he, was, he was a fisherman and he had a boat on the Ohio River. And he, you know, he'd fish for shrimp out of the river and, and fishes there and that's how he made his living. And other boats were out there, you know, and they all fished. They knew one another. They're just a bunch of old fishermen. He, he parked his boat on one side of the Ohio River and one night these people drove up there and the that there was a ferry. Everybody know what a ferry is? You pull up to a, to a river and there's a boat there and you pull your car up on the, on the boat and the boat takes your car across the river and you get on the other side and you drive off the boat and go where you're going on the other side of the river. That's when they didn't have bridges everywhere. I well, I, you, you're in Babylon. That's why you don't understand. So, anyway. <laughs> anyway. I was just a witness to you. Anyway, <laughs> he was sitting there with his boat, with his boat parked by the river. And these people pulled up there and they missed the ferry and it was going across the river. Well, it's going to take an hour to get back, get over there and unload the cars and come back. And they got out of the car and they're standing there and, they was, and Brother William Souders was there and he said, what are you folks doing? Y'all missed the ferry, didn't you? And they got to talking. They said, yes, and we're going to miss, we're going to a revival uh, just on the other side of the river and we're going to miss it because we're going to be too late. And he said, well, he said, come get in my boat and I'll take you over there and I'll just stay over there till y'all's revival's over and you get back in the, come, when you're done, come get back in my boat and I'll bring you back to your car. Just park your car over on the side of the road. So they did, and he went on, they went on the other side of the river, and he let them out, and they invited him to church, and he said, oh, no, nah, I don't think I'll go, but I'll, I'll be here when y'all get done. Just come back now. I'll, I'll take you back to your car. Well, <clears throat> he got to talking to them people. Well, he knew that revival was going on, and so God got to dealing with him, and he went over there one of those nights and went to the revival. And God got to dealing with him, and God saved him. In that revival. And after God saved him, he didn't get the Holy Ghost, he just got saved. See, even out there, depending on where you go, they'll tell you you got the Holy Ghost if you repent of your sins and the Spirit of God comes into your life. <clears throat> but that's not biblical. The Holy Ghost don't come in your life when you repent. If that had been true, everybody got it when they got baptized in water and John the Baptist had them to repent of their sins and be baptized. But <clears throat> even Paul asked those at Ephesus that had become disciples, he said, have y'all had the Holy Ghost since you believed? He wouldn't have asked them that question if you got it when you believed. But they said, we ain't heard about the Holy Ghost. Well, he baptized them over and they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and spake in tongues, which was a witness and a proof that they were born again. Anyway, Brother Souders, he was out there fishing one day on, a, on the river. And you know, they'd find, when they'd find fish, well, they all in boats would gather where the, where the school of fish was. And those boats would just get in circles and throw in their nets and they'd, they'd fish out that school of fish. Well, he was out there, other boats was out there, and he was on his boat, and he felt something down inside his stomach, and he felt like something's happening to me. And this began to roll in his stomach, and it worked up into his throat, 
And he knew something was fixing to happen to him. And he tried to grab his mouth because he knew he was fixing to do something that he didn't want those other men to see. But he couldn't hold it. And he began to blurt out in tongues. And he got the Holy Ghost right there on that boat. He said, I know all them men, said poor old Will. He's, he's fine, that, that, he said, that religion has, has drove him wild. It's drove him crazy. <laughs> but Brother Souders, after that, God began to deal with him. He began to read the Bible, and he began to go to church, and he began to testify. And before long, he was preaching. And he began to make friends with other preachers. And other preachers began to tell him, they finally got him alone, got him aside. And they said, Will, you've got to quit preaching some of the stuff you're saying. He said, why? They said, because it's not right. He said, well, how is it? So they began to tell him how it was. So he started trying to preach it the way they told him it was. But his anointing left him. He had a great anointing before that, but his anointing left him. And that started troubling him, and so he started praying. He said, God, why have you took my anointing away? Kept asking God that. One day the Lord told him, said, I called you to preach my gospel. See, when he was out there on the boat one day, he heard a voice, said, William Souders. He turned and looked. He thought, there's got to be another boat around here. Who's calling me? He didn't see nobody. He thought, that's strange. So he went back to doing what he's doing. A little while later, he heard that same voice. It said, William Souders. And he looked around, and then he realized, is God talking to me? And he, he bowed his head, and he said, Lord, is this you? And a voice from heaven said, I want you to preach my gospel. And he said, when he said the word my, it stood out above all the rest of the words. He said, I'll never forget it. And when he was praying about why God took his anointing away, this voice said, I called you to preach my gospel. And you're preaching man's gospel. And he broke down and started crying. He said, God, if, you'll, if you will give me my anointing back, I'll preach it just like you give it to me no matter what. And the message that God gave him was an understanding somewhat of the body of Christ. That term had never been used. You go back and search for it. It, it was used in the New Testament. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, said there is one body, there's one Lord, there's one Father who's above all and in you all. But there's just one body and one faith. See, faith comes by hearing, by hearing by the word of God, and there's just one truth of the word of God that gives you the true faith. Hallelujah. And so, <clears throat> uh, he, be, he got a revelation on the body body of Christ. He began to look at the New Testament. There was just one church. There was just one message they was preaching. They weren't preaching different messages. Didn't one preacher preach this, another one this. There wasn't organizations. They didn't vote preachers in or vote preachers out. God called them. God set in the church his leadership. God himself showed Jesus who to call as his 12 apostles. It was an operation of God from the very beginning. That church. <coughs> and William Souders was just a vessel that God used. He's just an old fisherman. He didn't really realize what God was doing in him at the beginning. But he realized there's something wrong with all this out here. There's just one body. All the, the early church, all those preachers were together. All those churches were connected to each other by 12 men, 12 apostles. 
They weren't separated and divided. They didn't have organizations. They didn't vote in leadership. God set them in order. They were chosen by the Spirit of God. He began to preach that message. And he began to hold meetings and he said, this meeting's open to all of God's people. You don't, you, he read the scriptures. He said, you can't, you can't judge this. You can't join this. We can't vote you in this. <clears throat> this is a family. You have to be born into it. <clears throat> if you're born of God, you're my brother. You're my sister and I cannot separate myself from you. I belong to the same, we belong to the same family. And he began to preach that message. My Lord. People began to come from all over and begin, and God would touch their minds. God would help them to see this is what God's doing. And God's adding his people. He's bringing them back together. And so the body of Christ came into existence back in 1914 and men from all sections. I used to belong to a Pentecostal uh, organization. But when I found this, I said goodbye, organization. I found my mama. I found what God's doing in the earth. I found what he's working on He's been restoring the church. He started getting us out of the pale horse, the Catholic church with the Protestant era. Then he brought us to Pentecostalism. And now we're, the body of Christ has been the very heart. Brother Souders taught the labor was the Pentecostal era, the type of the labor. And that's where you look in the woman's looking glasses and cl clean, wash yourself by the washing of the water of the word, the spirit of God, the anointed word, a cleanse you. And that's been the Pentecostal era, and Brother Souders was the very core of what God was doing in restoring the Pentecostal era to the United States because God chose don't think the United States is a great country because it's better. The people of, of the United States are better than other people in the world. That's not even close to being the truth. Biden says, come on, man. <laughs> I did listen to a little bit of it. I just had to turn it off after a little while. What did I just say about the truth? What was my last statement before I got off on that? See, God don't want me talking about that stuff. I got off track. The, the labor, that was the core. And here's what I was talking about is America's not greater because of other, other nations because we're better people. America is the land that God chose to restore his church in. That's why he put it in the mind of our forefathers to set up a declaration of independence that separated church from state so God could restore his church. See, the church couldn't be restored over in the Eastern world because that church over there had too much control over, the, the governments had too much control over the church. God set up a government in America that would allow his church to be restored. Now, we, we've had all this time that God's given us since 1776. That's 220, 44 years, isn't it? 244 years God's given. He's been working on getting his church restored in America. And if you're watching the government, you can see that this is a short-lived government. This government's falling apart, but God... He didn't mean for it to last forever because democracy is not God's government. God's government is theocracy. It's God's way. But he gave us democracy so that he could get man out of his way long enough to get his church restored. So we're, we are leaving the labor. I was telling in Bible study how 
when the high priest, when the the priest left the laver and went to to get into the holy place, he had to change out of a woolen garment into a white linen garment, and that's where we're at. We're in a garment change. God's requiring a garment change. God wants us to live righteous. When, we, when God gets us ready, we will be living. You can live without sin without being perfect. Don't you think you can? Jesus lived for 33 years before without being perfect, and he never committed a sin. He didn't have a fallen nature. He just had a human body that had a human mind that had the ability to sin just like Adam did. But until Adam sinned, he wasn't fallen. Jesus never did fall. Thank God. We've got a Savior in heaven that never failed. God. He obeyed God. He always did the will of the Father. God watched over him. The angels watched over him. But he didn't have an advantage over Adam. Adam was in a perfect environment. Jesus, in fact, I think Jesus had, I think he had a disadvantage over Adam because he was born in a corrupt world. Adam was born in a perfect environment. But with God's help, God led him and he never ever turned to the way of the flesh. He never turned over and never committed a sin. He's our Savior, and He came that you and I could have what He had, the life of His Father, and that God could help us to overcome this fallen nature of Adam and mature and be perfected or matured in the Spirit of the Father, in the nature of God that we've been born of. Hallelujah. Praise God. And he's going to get our brothers and our sisters out of Babylon when the church is fully restored. We're going to put on, we're putting on this white linen garment. And I'll tell you, I use the first chapter of 2 Peter to explain it, to show how Peter said, add to your faith virtue. And I teach this this way, that But the gate of faith is how you get in this. You're justified by by faith. The gate into the the pictures, the temple, the tabernacle. Just take the old tabernacle. The outer court, the holy place, the holy of holies. He said, he said, take, uh, add to your faith. See, that's how you get in. That's the gate. Now add virtue. Virtue is strength. It's power. Remember when Jesus, when the little woman with an issue of blood, she pressed her way through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. He turned around and he said, "Virtue! I felt virtue leave out of me. The power of God, the strength of the power of God, spirit, left me and went into that woman and healed her. Well, that's what virtue is. See, the, the offer, the, the sacrifice. See, you can have faith, but you can't have faith that will do you any good without a sacrifice of giving your life to God and you've got to get on the altar. You're going to have to put your flesh on the altar. That altar is going to have to destroy the old Adamic nature that's in you. So when you go to the altar, you become sanctified through your faith, repentance. <coughs> it's an operation of God through water baptism and repentance. And that's the Protestant movement is they got faith and they got sanctification that set them apart from the world. Come ye out from among them and be ye separate. You can't live like the world. You got to live as righteous as you know how. You got to get sin out of your life. And, you know, that's what Protestantism gave us in that restored part. But then he said, add to virtue knowledge, temperance, and patience. And that's the labor. That's what the Pentecostal era gave us in the body of Christ that William Souders was teaching. Pentecost out there right now, they don't have that. They don't have, they don't have too much knowledge, temperance, or patience. They don't. They're, they're, 
Brother Durham was telling me last night. He said, we went to church <clears throat> while we were here in a, in a Pentecostal church. He said, I don't know how people stay alive in there. He said, our church ought to be running over with people. We shouldn't even be able to get them in the door with what we've got compared to what they got. Well, because <clears throat> flesh loves flesh. Society, you know, social, social clubs do well. You start preaching the truth, tell people you've got to get sin out of your life, they don't want to hear it. So this separates the men from the boys. <clears throat> um, so add knowledge, temperance, and patience. That's that you, you gain knowledge in here with what God has revealed and then you have to be tempered in it. God's going to have to put you through some tests. He's going to have to let you go through them. And that's just natural. You get saved, the whole world's going to be against you. You're just a little old salmon swimming upstream trying to get back home. And everything in the world's against you. There ain't nobody really going to like you because you're going to bring conviction on everybody. And nobody wants to be judged. You know, you, you, you can go out here and Public, you can cuss like a sailor. Nobody's going to say a word to you. Just go out there and start talking about Jesus and see how much they edge up to you. They'll shed away from you like a ugly on a stick. I mean, beauty on a stick. Ugly's there. Beauty you can't find. Nobody wants to be around it. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> but then, add to your patience godliness. See, somewhere we have to become God-like. Your behavior. See, <clears throat> godliness is talking about your behavior and your speech, and that's not what's coming out of your mouth as much as is what's coming out of your action. See, you, you don't believe too much about what people say. Believe about what they do and what they are. What's their character? Add to your patience, godliness. This is now. This is out of the labor. This is the garment change. This is where you start putting on righteousness and start you. You become godlike because you are godlike, not because you're acting like you're godlike. It's because it's starting to become a part of your character. See, you say, how do you get this, brother Smith? You get here. You get here and you get these moves of the Spirit of God and the Word of God anointed that will touch your soul and it will change you. Lord. You can't change yourself. You can't overcome by yourself. It's going to take God to help you. Yes. Only God can deliver you. Yes. Only God. Yes. Yes. Amen. I mean, I know you can train a dog, but just take him away from training in a little while and he'll turn back to being a, an untrained dog. Now, you can try to train your flesh all you want to, but you still got flesh inside you. you Johnny's still standing up on the inside. <laughs> but if you'll give yourself to God, I'll promise you, God will help you. Oh, yeah. But you can't doubt. You got to make up your mind. I'm going to serve him. You got to be like Daniel, like the three Hebrew children. Whether God delivers me or not, I'm going to serve him. Get that in your mind, he'll start delivering you. And <clears throat> so add to godliness brotherly kindness. We was talking about that this morning. Godly fellowship. This is what caused you to start loving your brother. No matter what, no matter what he does, you'll treat him good anyway. Jesus had a Judas in his midst, and the other eleven didn't even know who was the devil. Who was the the one that was going to betray him, they never knew who he was. Because Jesus treated him so much like he treated the rest of them. He had to show them who he was in that last supper. He said, the one who I give some. The one that I sop down into the juice and give it to him, you'll know that's him. They didn't know before. Brotherly kindness. You get to that place where you start 
having God. See, that's a place where you're, you've got a garment change. And you're, you're going to start living righteous because it's in your character. When you, that's the place we can begin to live above sin. You've got to live above sin to get in the holy place. I'm telling you, saints. You've got to get to that place. God will get you there. All you've got to do is serve Him. Just serve Him. Just make up your mind. I'm going to serve you today, Lord. Serve Him today. And tomorrow morning, wake up, and I'm going to serve you another day. And just do it every day. And He'll get on your side. He'll begin to work with you. Hallelujah. And so, <clears throat> then look in the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation. Let me just give you a little bit of that. Most of you know this, but it's good. I enjoy preaching it hundreds of times over. You ought to enjoy listening to it that many times over just as much as I enjoy preaching it. Because it ought to mean something to you every time you hear it, every time you read it. Because it's one of the most precious truths Every one of the truths in the Word of God are the most precious golden nuggets. <laughs> that's, that's, see, see, when you, you know what Jesus said? He said, when you find the pearl wherein lieth the pearl, the, the, the field wherein lieth the pearl of great price, go sell everything you got and buy that field. That's talking about the body of Christ. When you find it, Sell out and make yourself a part of it because there's the pearl of great price. That's where you'll find life. <laughs> Hallelujah. I found this people and I heard this message. I said, goodbye to everything except becoming a part of this. I told God, I said, my family is so messed up. It's like a herd of buffalo running the wrong direction. I said, if you just touch me enough that I can just, I don't know if I can turn this thing around 180 degrees, but if you just help me begin to turn it, it'll be worth everything I give up just to help make a turn in my family and the people that I have any influence in you know what he did? He helped me make a 180 degree turn. Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah, I didn't just make a curve, a turn. I turned all the way around. And I'm headed, I'm headed for life. I've got an understanding of what life's all about and how to get there. And it made more sense to me than anything. I'm not going to heaven. You know, God's going to change me. That don't even make sense anymore. That's the most foolish thinking there is anymore to my mind. But to think that God, God can make me God-like. God can put His nature in me and I can overcome this Adamic nature, the fallen nature of man, and I can become righteous. It's a process, yes. But God, what's impossible with man is possible with God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I believe in the impossible. Yeah. I believe I'm living the impossible dream. Yeah. 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 I, I'm on my way to glory. Yeah. God is, you know, I'm His workmanship. He's working righteousness in me. He won't have to change me when He's done with me. I won't sin. I won't have nothing wrong with me. He'll have to give me for me to house all of this, he's going to have to give me a glorious body. Yes. Woo! He's going to have to give me something that won't fade away. I don't know what 10,000 years is going to be like. I don't know what a million years is going to be like. I don't know what a billion years is going to be like. But if you're here in a billion years, I'll be with you. That's my faith. I'm not accepting nothing else, Sister Crow. I'm not accepting anything else. I don't know what that new body's going to be like. I've got arthritis in my hands. They never quit hurting. They hurt every time I move them. Every finger I move hurts. I, I just live with it. 
you got your your room? Yeah. Yeah, Arthur, he lives with me now. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to kiss old Arthur goodbye. You and your big fat nose and your beard and the whole works is going down the river. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, Revelation 18. Let me read right quick. This is going to happen in the, in the restored church. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. It's talking about this ministry of the early, the latter reign restored church. And the earth was lightened with his glory. See, that's, that's what I'm doing today. I'm trying to give you understanding. That's light. You turn off the lights, it's dark. You can't see where you're going. Somebody turns the light on for you, you can tell where you're going. If a man of God can tell you the truth about the word of God, he'll, oh, he'll give you light and understanding. That's what light is. It's understanding. <clears throat> <clears throat> and he cried mightily with a strong voice. Look, I got, let me give it another drink of this. He cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean bird. <laughs> See, that's symbolic. Unclean birds are, those are people, <clears throat> yeah, they're, they're, you know, unclean birds was like a, ra like a raven. They eat, they feed on, uh, like a, um, What'd you call it? A vulture. Yeah, they feed on dead things. <clears throat> for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This fornication is talking about it's <clears throat> immoral, it's spiritual immorality. It's having to do with these organizations. It's having to do with, with falsehood, false teachings. See, <clears throat> God loves his people out there and he has to let this go on until he can get the, the body of Christ restored where it can accomplish gathering God's people into his body. See, a body, look at my body. If you cut this arm off and throw it over there on that side of the room, this one off, throw it over there, and this leg and you throw it back there, you can't say that that's, there, that's still part of the body. It's, it's not a hook to the body anymore. This body's together. And that's the way the early church was. It was connected in every way. All the ministry was connected. Those churches were connected by the same Spirit of God and the same Word of God. The same operation of God. The same order of God. It wasn't divided up. It wasn't a man-made government. Now God's had to deal. He's had to put up with all that, trying to get man back to a restored church. And he will get it. The Bible shows it. He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitations of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and cage of every unclean bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. For the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, for the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice, now here's the kicker, shows who she is, saying, come out of her, my people. Where is my people? Where's God's people? Why is he going to call them out? Why is he calling them out of her? Who is she? Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath gloriously glorified herself, lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her for she saith in her heart, I'll sit a queen, and I am no widow, and 
shall see no sorrow. See, they're, they're all saying, I'm okay. We're going to heaven. You know, <clears throat> when, when you get saved out there, you're going to heaven, whether you want to go or not. You can change your mind if you want to. It don't matter. You're going anyhow. If you're saved, you're going. If you got saved, you're going. Somebody told me just yesterday, said now there's churches that you don't have to go up front. If that's embarrassing you to go up front to get saved, they, <clears throat> they have an app. And you can just fill out the app. And it has the sinner's prayer on the app. You say the sinner's prayer and you fill it out and tell them, I, I said this sinner's prayer and I want to be a member. And you, you're automatically added to the church. But the Bible says that God adds to the church daily such as should be saved. I can't vote you in this. We're not going to vote on it. If God saves you and adds you to this, you're my brother. And I have to accept you. When mom and daddy had Kent, my little brother, they didn't say, y'all want to vote on this? We think about having another kid. You, you, you boys want to vote? If they had to vote, I think I'd have voted No. I think Jacob would have voted no. You know, he, he, he already, when they, when they <laughs> I mean, he, they just kept telling him, move over. <laughs> move over. Give me some of your clothes, some of these clothes now. Matthew's big enough to have some of your clothes. <laughs> Where is Matthew anyway? Where's he at? He's out for right now. Maybe it's good he wouldn't didn't hear that. <laughs> anyway, but they didn't. We didn't vote on it. They just had him and said, "Here's your little brother. Learn to love him." And I did. He's my brother, and that's the way you are. You, the Lord added you, and I can't do nothing about it. There's been a few in here that I wish the Lord hadn't added. Not, not now. Not anybody in here like that right now, but I've had that problem a time or two in my life since I've been here. But see, I've had to learn that I got to learn to love the unlovable. See, I found out, and this hurt me, but I found out several years after I got here, people couldn't stand me when I first got here. That hurt my feelings. Yeah, I was something else. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, she, she, she said, I'm not a widow. I don't see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning, famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication live deliciously. Well, this is talking about re big religious in high places, religion in high places. They've committed a lot. Did you know they say 50 million people were martyred under the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages? 50 million. The church killed people? Can you, under, can you fathom that? But it's not just that. There's, there, I showed you the red horse had power to kill people. They, they didn't literally kill people, but they killed, they, they did, you know, they, in other words, they run them off. They killed their ability to, to be a part. <laughs> Live deliciously with her, shall be well her, and lament her when she shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon. The word Babylon means confusion. It comes from the word Baal, the false god Baal. That mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. That hour is a prophetical hour. It's a 15 year period. So God's going to judge. Now let me, let me just skip over here. Because uh, we ain't got time to read all this. But you can, read it, you can read it more when you get home if you want to. Verse 20 says, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you. On her. It's because the blood of the saints are in her, is why. Um, somebody find that scripture right there on the blood of the saints, and I'll, I'll, uh, 
Uh, it's in the 19th chapter for sure, but let me first read this. In verse 21, it said, And the mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city, Babylon, be thrown down and be found no more at all. See, God's going to judge that system. But before he does, he's going to have a message of a ministry that's going to say, Come out of her, my people. God's going to gather his people. Everyone that God can get out of that, he'll get them out of that and bring them into the body of Christ. Just like he got everybody out of Judaism and brought them into the body of Christ in the early church. He'll gather all of his people together in one body and he will finally bring them. He'll finally bring them to eternal life. He'll bring them to the fullness of the stature of the man, Christ Jesus. And then he said, oh, remember that millstone, that millstone, remember Jesus said there'd be, there's two women grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other will be left. You know what they taught me out there? That I would be taken to heaven and the other woman would be left. You know what they taught me in here? God will take her out in judgment and the body of Christ will be the only thing left. When God finishes judging, he'll judge all sin, and the righteous people of God what will be left standing. And the voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters, those, are, those really are ministers of God that have different gifts. Those are messages. Shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found no more in thee. And the sound of the millstone will be heard no more at all in thee. See, there's two women grinding at the mill. That, you know what, I'm, you know what that, that's talking about? It's talking about, you know, they used to take wheat. They used to take a big old rock bowl and a big old stone and they'd take wheat in that and they'd grind. They'd grind that, that seed until it was ground to powder and they could take that flour and bake it into bread. That's a picture. That we're, that's what I'm working on today. I'm grinding at the mill. I'm grinding up powder that you can make the bread of life out of and eat it and live. Lord. Hallelujah. That's still out there in Babylon. Our brothers and sisters still, they still have the sound of the millstone out there. And they still have the sound of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters and shall be heard no more at all in thee. God is going to remove that eventually in judgment, but not till he gets his people out of it. <clears throat> Verse 23, And the light of a candle. Don't ever confuse yourself that that's a candlestick. They ain't never had a candlestick, a seven-fold light out there. That's just the light of a candle. It's just they got some light. God gave them some light. He's gave them some knowledge of the word of God. They're working on it. They're grinding at the mill, but they've got the wrong spirit. They've got the wrong order. They don't have the truth, and they're, they're, they're cemented in their ways. They will not change. And God, just like God cut Israel off, he'll cut that off. If he can't get people out of that, get them to hear the truth, he'll cut it off eventually. The light of the candle shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom. See, the, the Jesus is the bridegroom. He's still working out there. He still loves his people. There's people saved out there that God wants us to save and bring into his body and help them to finish their course in God. They'll never be able to finish it out there because it's the wrong order and they don't have the truth, all of the truth of God, and God's going to have to get them out of there to save them completely. And the voice of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For the merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found, here it is, the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now turn to the ninth chapter of Proverbs and I'll quit. I'll get done with it. All right. Ninth chapter of Proverbs. 
says, wisdom's builded her house. See, wisdom is a her. See, some people say that the reason that the Trinity believes in the, the Spirit, the, the Holy Ghost being a person because it's called a he. Well, here wisdom's called a she. Calls hell a she too. I was telling Brother Noah before church, I said, you know, the Bible calls hell a she. Is that? I said, now I know some 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 men might think that hell's a woman, but <laughs> forgive me, ladies. You know, I don't believe that. I believe y'all are little darlings, little angels. <laughs> yeah, you better believe that. Wisdom hath builded her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. Those seven pillars is God and Christ and a five-fold ministry. That right there proves there's just two in the Godhead if you see it. See, God and Christ, his son, and then his five-fold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, those five, God and Christ, is the pillars that hold the church up. She has killed her beast. She's mingled her wine. She's also furnished her table. See, we, we're, that's what we're doing. We're killing this beast. Ecclesiastes 3 says that uh, if God don't help you to see that you yourself are like beast of the field. As one dieth, so dieth the other. See, if, if, you don't, if God don't help you see that, you won't realize that I don't have a chance of life after death. I'm just like an animal. But, but, so wisdom, she's killed her beast. We're, we're killing this, you know, that's what I was telling the Bible, in Bible study, I still got things in me that I'm trying to get rid of. I mean, I got, uh, you know, I got a lamb in me, but every once in a while a lion roars and a bear sticks up his head. A mad dog. <laughs> Every once in a while, it it, and I'm I'm trying to kill him. I'm trying to stay with the Word of God enough that it kills those beastly characteristics that's inside of me. See, even Peter talked about us being like dogs that eat they they eat their vomit. They go back. You know, they get saved. It's like a hog wallowing in the mire. You wash them, they go right back to the mire. <laughs> See, God uses animals to show you what we're like. She's killed her beast. She's mingled her wine with God and God's people. The spirit, our spirit. We've learned how to mingle our spirit and get in harmony with God's spirit. She has furnished her table. we we finally have prepared the food of God that will give you the bread of life and help you to live. She has sent forth her maidens and she crieth upon the highest place of the city. Let me tell you something. The highest place of the city is the body of Jesus Christ. That's the highest you can get in influence of the things of God. Every religion is a high place because it's influential. See, it says, she sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest place of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith unto him, Come eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. He that reproveth a scorner gets to himself a shame. Himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. So you try to correct somebody that don't want to be corrected and they'll shame you. Or you try to correct a man that's wicked or evil and he'll, he'll blot you out. He don't want nothing to do with you. Give instruction to a wise man and he'll be yet wiser. So you, you, you give man a counsel and instruction to someone that's, that wants wisdom, they'll get wiser. They'll receive it. Teach a just man and he'll increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is in the beginning of, is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of holy is understanding. For 
By me thy days shall be multiplied and the years of thy life shall be increased. That's wisdom. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself, but if thou be scornous, thou alone shalt bear it. Now let's look at, now that's talking about one woman. Wisdom's built her house. Now let's look at this other woman. See, he's showing you two women. A foolish woman is clamorous. She's simple and knoweth nothing. These are talking about, this is talking about the body of Christ in Babylon. For she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city. See, it's not the highest place, but it is a high place because it's influential. For to call passengers who go right on their ways, whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. See, stolen waters. You, you can go out there and feel the Spirit of God because they've learned how. They've learned how to worship God and use the Spirit of God. But that God, you know, those, are, those waters are stolen waters. They're using them to bless themselves and, and encourage themselves. I, I'm not saying the Spirit of God's not out there. It is, but it's used wrong. Y'all ever watch Benny Hinn? He's a fake. He's a fake. That's fake out there to think that that man can do the things he's doing. In fact, they've proven that he goes to people before them meetings and pays them to do the things they do to increase people's faith so they'll believe on him. They've proved that. They've got people to admit that that's true. 18, Be, but he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. See, stolen waters are sweet. And bread. This woman, she's a foolish woman. She don't know anything. But to the passers, she tells passengers who go on their way, whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And for him that wanteth understanding, she said to him, stolen waters are sweet, bread eaten in secret. The reason it's eaten in secret because this is an organization and you've got to join it and believe our articles of faith because that's our secret. Do you remember what Jesus said? When they say unto you, go to this place, go not, for I won't be there. See, they, they were claiming that, he, they were, that, that the Judaizers had Christ, or had got what God wanted for the people, but he wasn't there. He wasn't there with them anymore because he moved on in Jesus Christ. But, these passers by when he, he, he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. That's not talking about a burning hell. It's talking about a religious hell. You read back in the fourth, the fourth seal that was opened in Revelation 6, which was the pale horse, the rider was death and hell followed with her. That was the Catholic Church in the hellish condition of religion. See, Jesus even told some of the Pharisees and Sadducees, he said, you are whited sepulchers. You know what that is? That's gravestones. You're in a graveyard. You don't have any life. Well, I know when you read this, it, it, it puts, but see, I'm not trying to put the judgment on Babylon yet, but I'm telling you, God is going to judge that system. It is going to come into judgment because it's not going to change. And God is going to get his people out of there. Why would it show you in the Bible, come out of her, my people? And then, let me, I'm going to finish with this. I want to show you something in Revelation 19. Where you, since we're on it, for some of you brethren that are a little bit more in studious in Bible school, being Bible scholars and saints too, in the 19th chapter. Now, after God judges Babylon, <clears throat> he, he goes on. Now, I want you to look at two scriptures. I want you to look at 
Revelation 6 and the fifth seal where the souls are under the altar. The ninth verse. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until thy, their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Okay, here's these souls under the altar. Now let me, let me you, I want you brethren to get this. These seals are in chronological order. Starts off the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse, and then the souls under the altar, the fifth seal. Now see, our older teaching has been that, that those souls under the altar are those that made the bride under the early church. Takes it completely out of context, takes it out of chronological order, takes it back to the early church in the white horse stage. The next seal is a sixth seal, which is judgment in the end of the Gentile world. It doesn't fit anywhere to be in order like that. And, and here's what you see in those souls under the altar. They're crying, Lord, how holy and true, how long till you avenge our blood? It's like the blood of Abel was crying out to God when Cain slew him and, and God dealt with Cain. It, it just showed you in the beginning God was well aware of what Cain done and why he had to deal with it, why he had to judge it. What, what's ha what this seal here is, is God letting us know that their souls under the altar that's the brazen altar, by the, by the way. They never got, they're not under the golden altar. Number one, no soul ever went under the golden altar. That, that altar, <clears throat> that's where incense was lifted up. No, nothing rested underneath it, just coals that you burned incense on. There was no souls under the golden altar, but under the brazen altar. That's where those souls, they were martyrs under the Catholic Church which followed the pale horse. Fifty million of them were martyred. And God is saying, I'm aware of this condition. And I'm aware it needs to be judged, but I'm not going to judge it right now. I can't. And the reason I can't is because the system has to come to a full, a fullness to where I can judge the whole system, not just for what they've done to you, I have to let the system go to its complete wickedness. Before I judge Babylon, I'm going to judge it, but I'm not going to judge it until it finishes its iniquity. That's when I'll judge it. He's just showing you it's available. Now look in the 19th chapter, the first verse. After he judges Babylon, it says, After these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. He did not forget to avenge her blood. How long, O Lord, holy and true, doth thou not avenge our blood? He avenged it right there when he judged the system in the end of the world. They had to wait a season. By the way, where it says little season, you can go back and search that. It just means a time. It doesn't necessarily mean a little. It just means a time. Uh, <clears throat> that's what the translators put there for the word but God did not forget to avenge her blood, the blood of the saints that were under the altar. They had to wait until the iniquity was full. In the end of the Gentile world, God
God's going to judge that system, and He will avenge the blood of all of them that have the that, that the blood of the prophets and the saints. They're guilty of, and that's not just talking about murdering. It does. It is mean murdering unto unto physical death, but it also means to murder. There's souls that were killed. There's people that's in by, in the world today because of un righteous men in religion has, that have hurt them souls. They're victims today. And God's going to avenge that because they're never going to repent of it. It's a system. It's a political system of religion. I'm sorry, but you just got to face the truth sooner or later. But God has called a people. He's still calling today. God's people come to the body of Christ. Help us as God works in us to restore the church and get God's people in the body of Christ. Now, let me tell you what's going to happen out here in the future. Out here in the future, the beast is going to speak, and they're going to gather all of the people together. Seven women will join up with one man. <laughs> Isaiah 4. Seven women are going to take a hold of this one man and say, let us... Be called by thy name. Let us, uh, let us have our own apparel. Let, it, let us still hold, have our organization. But let us be called by thy name to take away the reproach. What reproach? The, the reproach of being divided. Being separated. The Catholic Church still says everybody that's not in the Catholic Church is separated from the true church. And... and I'm afraid to tell you, but the two-horned beast, which I feel is America, is going to set up the mark of the beast and give the Pope our power, and that will be the eighth head of the beast system. And God's people and all these organizations are going to join up with that system. You know what they're going to say? It's the healing of the body. They're, you know, they're all using the term body of Christ out there. They all think they're part of the body of Christ, but you ain't the part of the body of Christ if you're in a division in a separate group. You can't be one body and be separated. But they're going to say, this is the healing of the body. We've all come together. <laughs> oh, God. And many are going to be deceived by that. They can believe what you can believe, whatever you want to believe, just be a member. Just take the mark of the beast. Six, six, six. The body of it is six is the number of man. The body of it is man's number. It's man made body. It's an organization built by man, not by God. Soul. The soul of it. Body soul. The soul of it. That's the mind of it. Your, your, your soul is, is basically the heart. It's, it's your heart. The heart, your, the soul is your heart or your mind. That's who you are. You can't separate your mind from who you are. That's who you are. You are what you think. You are who you think you are. You are what your mind is. God has to renew your mind. Be you renewed by the, or be ye, can, let's see, you be, help me. Be ye transformed, thank you, by the renewing of your mind that you might prove that which is good, acceptable and perfect will of God. So for you to be, God's going to have to renew you because your mind is, is it's the, way, the iniquitous way of man. It's man's fallen ways of life. And God has to help us. He has to renew our mind. That's your soul. And that's the soul, the mindset of that system. 666 six, six, body. The body of it's man made. The, man, the mindset, the teaching of it is man's teachings. It's not God's truth. And spirit, the spirit of it is man's spirit. It's, it, look, let me tell you something. When I was in the army, let me tell you something about this. When I was in the army and I graduated from from uh, boot camp. We, we marched. We had to march before the colonel. I mean the general. Of that. Of, of I was in Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. When we was marching. 
And I had on my, my, my formal grays. And we was marching. And we marched by that colonel and all eyes went right and we all saluted him when we walked by. I'm telling you, a spirit rose up in me. I felt, I felt like I could shout. I felt something powerful in me. You know why? Because synergy. You know what synergy is? Synergy is when... We, synergy is... It's the power of a group. It's the power of one spirit. You know, synergy is more, it's, it, it's power when people get together. In fact, I feel synergy in here today. I feel like it's God's synergy. The Spirit of God's helping us to have synergy. You know, synergy is not, and synergy is not, it, it ain't, it, in my, it's, not, it's not one, it's not like math. In math, one plus one's two. Synergy is different than that. It's multiplication. In God, God's synergy is one can put a thousand to flight. See, one with synergy equals a thousand. And then one plus one, it ain't two, it's ten thousand. Two can put ten thousand to flight. That's synergy. That's God's synergy. See, the power of God, when the Spirit of God puts us together and the power of the Spirit working together, that's why Jesus said, He said, These things have I done, but greater shall you do because I'm going to the Father. He was just one. He could just put 10,000 to flight. A thousand, yeah. But when he had to them 12, <laughs> synergy. The power of God harnessed in a group of people that God was working in. Hallelujah. Praise God. What time is it? Woo! Praise God. You got a bonus today, didn't you? I thought it was about 1 o'clock. I thought maybe we even had time to spare. Well, let's, let's look. Brother Durham's on his way home. If I don't take up an offering, he's going to be upset at me. That's his job, to make sure we've got enough money to pay the bills, him and Sister Durham. So let's, let's pray before we go home. We're, look, y'all owe me so many Wednesday nights, I could preach till dark tonight, and you still would owe me more. There's nothing wrong with the good word of God when it's anointed of God. Praise His wonderful name. I'm thankful today. Thank you all for that good song you sung us. It's, it's Brother Noah and Kayla's fault that I preached this long message because they inspired me with that good song about the body of Christ and the head of the body is Jesus Himself, the rider of the white horse. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, pray for Wichita. They had 21 people confirmed with COVID the virus, COVID, but none of them have been in the hospital. To my knowledge yet, I just talked to him day before yesterday. They were all getting over it. It just might seem like mild cases. So let's keep praying for them. And then there's something like 50 cases in the Houston church that had a big outbreak there. And, but but most of them all have minor, they're, they're mild cases. So let's keep praying. Let's keep praying for them. Sister Sherry Riley, I know, went into intensive care uh, with uh, CPAP machine. But she wasn't on vent. It got on the Internet that she was on vent, but her husband put on there. There's nothing said about going on no vent. It's a CPAP machine. They just put her in there for closer observation. So let's keep praying for Sister Riley. I, I always enjoy listening to her sing. Brother Mark Marler, yes, he, he's getting some of his movement in his body back on his right side. He's still not talking yet, I don't think. But, um, and they did have to put him on a feeding tube, is that right? Because he's not eating. Let's keep praying for Brother Mark Marler. He's been a faithful man for many, many years. And so I think he's worthy of our prayers. Sister Bridget? 
Brother Daniels, yes, he's in the hospital. Uh, they're holding him because they feel like there's something wrong with his heart. If they can figure it out, that would help him not keep taking on all this fluid and having to drain it off of him. So he's doing good, but they're holding him, running more tests on him. Okay, Sister McGowan says he's having kidney function problem this morning. So let's keep him in our prayers. Uh, Sister Addie? Or Brother and Sister Durham? Yes, they're on their, they're supposed to make it to Amarillo tonight. They're on their way home. He called me last night and he said, I can't wait to get home and get back in church. <clears throat> he said, have you, have you all been taking up offerings since I've been gone? I said, oh yes, Brother Durham, we're, we're faithful. We're, don't worry about that. We're, we're doing the right thing. <laughs> so I can't wait to get back. He really didn't say that. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> anyway, let's pray for him and Sister Sister Durham. They're going to be in Springfield tomorrow sometime. And Brother Brother Jacob and Sister Terry are going to go up and pick them up. And they'll be home Tuesday. So let's keep praying that they get back home safe. What else we need to pray for today? Yes, Sister Amber. Praise God. That's her nephew that had uh, the heart transplant. And he's doing good according to the test. So that's a good report. We've been praying for him. Yes, Sister Donna Henderson, Sister Ann also, Strata. She, they need our prayers. And keep praying for the McPhee family. I, I miss the McPhees. And, uh, I think, you know, uh, I think he's a little bit uh, worried about getting back in a group that, you know, where, with this coronavirus going on. But let's keep praying for them because we certainly want them to be a part. And uh, so keep them in your prayers. Who else do we need to pray for? Our sister Cindy, Michael and Cindy are, are out today. She's been uh, trying to help her mother in Fort Worth get situated. And, and uh, her she's 82, her health's bad. They may have to even move her here before it's over with to help take care of her. So keep them in your prayers because it's, you know, uh, when your folks get old, and I'm praying they do a good job because... All right, what else? Sister Chelsea? Uh-huh, brother, that, you're talking about v, Brother Veely's little granddaughter? Okay. All right, Brother Veely's little granddaughter. She certainly had a bout with the cancer, so let's keep her in our prayers. Brother Larry Bryant has uh, uh, what kind of cancer is it? Uh, no, it's not his kidneys. It's his pancreas. Pancreas cancer. So, he had tests last week. It hadn't grown any, but it hadn't reduced any, his tumor, any either. But So, it's good that it didn't any larger, but they're wanting it to go, you know, get smaller, so let's keep praying for that. Who had their hand up? Somebody back here I thought had their hand up. Bridget, you have another prayer request? What is it? What would you say, Hannah? Okay. Maddie Perry is cancer free in the Dallas Church. Praise God for that. That's good. It's good to have Sister Hannah. She's she's part of us, but you know sometimes she can't be with us. So I always love to see her. She, this girl can sing. The reason I know it because one day we was up here cleaning the church. She's back there in the back, just singing away. 
I heard her back there singing. So we're gonna get her. We're gonna get her to. We're gonna unleash that in her one of these days. Get her to sing for us. She likes to sing. She got a talent. You can't hide that in the earth. You can't hide that in the earth. You got to give that to the Lord. And let it work. All right. Let's all stand. Keep praying for brother and sister Weaver and his wife Susan. Pray for them. Uh, pray for Sister Crow. Let's pray for one another. Pray for me. Yes, I need prayer. If you don't need prayer, then pray for me. I do. Praise God. If the ushers will come. We'll receive your offering. And, and uh, you'll go home with a paradigm change. You'll, be, you'll have a different perspective on church getting out at 2 o'clock. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, for your goodness to us. Your mercy, your great grace. Oh, God, touch these that are in need. These churches that have this virus. God, protect them. Cover them, Lord. And let them get over this without it hurting their, their bodies. Oh, God, touch this little uh, child, Bella, that has this bout with cancer. Lord, God, honor Brother Veely and that assembly and help this child. Oh, God, work your will, your perfect will in her life. Oh, God, if it would fit in your will, heal her, Lord, of this cancerous condition. Oh, God, we give you praise today. Touch Brother Marler. God, help him today and raise him up from this stroke that he's had. Oh, precious Lord, God, we love you today. God, watch over your people. Thank you for Brother Noah being with us today. Watch over him in his, his schooling, his education. Direct him, guide him, and help him, oh God. To know your will, Lord. Praise God. Sister Cindy's mother, touch her today, Lord. Oh, precious Lord, we give you praise today. Touch Southern, Sister Crow. God, keep working in her life. Help each one of us, Lord. Direct us, lead us, and guide us. Touch this body. Touch this ministry. Touch our leaders of the land, Lord. Oh, God, help us. God, give us a little more time and help us to be more diligent to work with it if you give us more time in this body. Touch your ministry in this body. God, help us to get united. Help us to have peace. God, help us in this garment change time. Oh, Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lamb of God. God bless your hearts as you give today, saints. Thank you for your goodness. Amen, amen. We'll get Brother Painter to come up here so I can write my check. I want the Lord's blessing. Praise God. All right. God bless you as you give. Come on, Brother Painter or Brother Fisher, one, one of y'all. Let's move on. There are greater things ahead. Let's press closer to Him and be spirit led. For our Lord, let's take a stand as we go throughout the land and build the church that our Lord is waiting for. 
Oh, let's move on. There are greater things ahead. Let's press closer to him and be spirit-led. For our Lord, let's take a stand as we go throughout the land and build the church that our Lord is waiting for. Let's press closer to him and be spirit-led. For our Lord, let's take a stand as we go throughout the land and build a church that our Lord is waiting for. Let's move on. There are greater things ahead. Let's press closer to him and be stand as we go throughout the land and build a church that our Lord is waiting for. Let's move on. There are greater things ahead. Let's press closer to him and be spirit-led. For our Lord, let's take a stand as we go throughout the that our Lord is waiting for. Let's move on. There are greater things ahead. Oh, let's press closer to him and be spirit-led. For our Lord, let's take a stand as we go throughout the land and build the church that our Lord is on can y'all hear me brother Sharber told me that he preaches with his mask on I don't know about that I don't know if I could do that this thing gets hot anyway uh, <clears throat> uh, you know on our website is the all of our messages now, it takes them a little while to download them so if you want to like that message today, if you want to hear it again, I know some of you just can't hardly wait to get it to hear it again. <laughs> anyway, you can get on the website and listen to it again. You know, it's on there, huh? You can watch it. Yeah, it's even yeah, even you you see my pretty face without the mask. Yeah, so you kind of can't tell who I am right now, but. 
Anyway, you can't tell, yeah, if I'm grinning or frowning what I'm doing. Anyway, God bless your hearts. Hey, let's get busy. There's too many people that need this message. Let's get busy and get them in here. Remember, the sheep have sheep. I'm expecting some of y'all to bring forth here before long. Wave at one another and be friendly. God bless your hearts. I'll see you next Sunday. I'll talk to you again on, what is it, Thursday night, 7 o'clock.